Hello and welcome to episode 28 of Question and Answer, and I am your host and question answerer, Panyo Basa. And it's just kind of amazing to me that we're, we've done 28 of these, or I've done 28 of them anyway. And uh, if you average like 18 questions per episode, which is probably a very conservative estimate, then... Uh, I've, by the end of this episode, I will have answered more than 500 questions, which is kind of a lot of questions, although sometimes I do repeat myself and answer the same sort of question more than once, but still, ah, sweet tea, I'm living in the South. So I'll just wade into this, and the first question is from Saul Invictus. And Saul Invictus says, I am curious about where do you lean in philosophy of mind? I have two of your books and I don't seem to grasp where you belong. Are you a property dualist, cosmopsychist, monistic idealist, panpsychist, naturalist, or maybe something entirely different? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. It's like a Western philosophy question, which is... Uh, kind of nice. Although, to tell you the truth, I haven't really categorized my uh, philosophy of mind. Um, I don't think philosophy of mind is the same as epistemology, is it? I think that's philosophy of knowledge or something. Um, but I've, I've discussed my philosophy before. Um, just the, the basic can be explained, uh, you know, through the simile of the block of marble, which, which I've explained several times if not many times. And uh, so you've got ultimate reality can be compared to just like this block of marble just out in the middle of a barren plain. There's nothing to compare it with. So it doesn't, you can't really say what size it is because there's really nothing to compare it with. You might as well say that it's sizeless. And within that block of marble is every possible statue. In fact, there's like, impossible statues in there too you know like uh a statue of someone with uh with legs as thin as hairs that wouldn't really stand up in reality or you can have moving statues and so forth in that block of marble every single atom is already there you know it's just it, all you have to do is remove the excess rock and and the statue is already in there and I would say the universe works that way. Um, you've got just infinite formless energy or consciousness, which uh, theists would call God. Um, but because it is infinite and formless, um, it becomes paradoxical because it's, it's sizeless. I mean, you can't say whether it exists or doesn't exist because it just transcends the duality of existence or non-existence. But every single possible statue, every single possible manifestation of energy is contained within that infinite energy. And uh, so you've got some of these statues become complicated enough that they become self-aware. And that would be us. We are virtual statues contained within this infinity that have become uh, recursive, self-aware, and then we become essentially deluded in thinking that we're separate from the rest of it. So um, maybe that would make me a monistic idealist of, of this list here. I'm not sure what a cosmopsychist is. Um, I'm certainly not a dualist. Panpsychist? Yeah, I'm not a a naturalist, except just uh, at the superficial level of explaining samsara. Yeah, I mean, it's, I have a degree in biology. So um, yeah, I do have some uh, use for scientific empiricism as a way of explaining this um, virtual conditional world that we're living in. So yeah, I guess, I guess that's me. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's complicated to say, I mean, human language is not designed to really talk about reality. So 
I might as well throw in that uh, almost the only thing that Hegel ever wrote or said that I have any use for is his idea and with which he starts his dialectic and his logic. And that is, he starts with pure being, which would be kind of like God or Brahman of the Hindus or Tao, something like that. That's the, that's the thesis. That's the first thesis of the dialectic. And of course, uh, Hegelian dialectic then has the antithesis. And the antithesis is pure non-being. So he points out that pure being and pure non-being are completely devoid of any distinct determinate content. So they just kind of blend into each other. They're really indistinguishable. And then throughout the rest of his logic, he just takes that as a given that pure being and pure non-being are synonymous. So absolute everything and absolute nothing, you can't really tell them apart. And so that kind of explains how the universe comes into being, or at least seems to, because uh, um, just everything is nothing. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just kind of, uh, kind of wallowing in the, or, or straying off into nonsense here. So, um, yeah, Saul Invictus, I mean, you apparently know more about the meanings of these categories than I do. So uh, you can uh, figure it out for yourself. But I'm certainly not a materialist. I do not believe that physical matter is ultimately real. So there is that. And uh, I do have a rather philosophical interpretation of uh, dependent core rising or Padija Samupana in, uh, in Buddhism, where it's like <clears throat> all these conditions, nothing has a distinct self entity. You know, there is no self entity. That's largely what um, <clears throat> the, the Buddhist teaching of no self is about, or it can be interpreted that way, that um, everything exists because it's conditioned by other things. And ev all these other things are also likewise conditioned by other things. And so you've got this virtual reality that's just sort of self-conditioning. And there's an infinite number of those. And uh, the ultimate essence or substance um, you can call it mind, consciousness. I do think that the universe itself is uh, conscious in a way. That uh, even a hydrogen atom may have some this tiny elemental spark of consciousness to it. It just can't think, of course. It doesn't really cognize anything. But um, what a physicist calls energy is really just a very simple elemental form of what a psychologist calls consciousness and what a psychologist calls consciousness is just a very complicated organized form of what a physicist would call energy so I guess I'm some kind of idealist so let's just move on to the next question here before uh, everyone gets so confused they just turn off the, uh, the video and the next question is from Matthew and Matthew says it seems that the purpose of religious vocational behavioral constraints, such as the Vinya, or rule of St. Benedict, is to impose external discipline in order to foster the growth of a more natural form of inner discipline. Please be so kind as to offer a reflection. Well, I remember uh, a wise old monk, Burmese monk, Seattle Uzotika, Mahamyain Uzotika, who's known as Ujotika in the West, said that the purpose of Vinaya, Buddhist monastic discipline, is to cause the, the life of a monk to be simple and blameless. And I think that's about right. I really can't say with regard to the rule of St. Benedict. I've never really studied Catholic monastic discipline. Um, but with regard to Buddhist monastic discipline, it simplifies your life. And, uh, and also just uh, with regard to society, it makes the, the behavior of monks blameless, or at least it did in ancient India. Nowadays, a monk acting blamelessly in accordance with the customs of ancient India might be blamed sometimes in the modern or postmodern West, like a monk that won't touch women might really offend feminists, for example. Um, so, yeah, I, in a way it helps with regard to spiritual development by, first of all, 
you're you're not indulging in immoral behavior so it it's it you've got less like uh pushback from the universe or uh you know like karmic uh retribution getting in the way and makes things very simple so that your mind is clear you don't have a guilty conscience so much because you're not wallowing in immorality so it just makes your mind clear and simple and then it makes it easier to practice dhamma and uh, make progress and you don't have uh, angry mobs with uh, torches and pitchforks uh, besieging the monastery so I think that's that's the main purpose of it okay the next question also from Matthew since returning to normal life, has the sudden removal of enforced behavioral discipline caused a decrease in your ability to maintain equanimity? Has increasing the difficulty setting of your life increased or expanded your skillfulness in the application of Dhamma? Or have you found the grind of daily life to be eating away at some of your previously developed skillfulness? My sincere apologies if this question is too personal. Well, those of you familiar with... Uh, these uh, videos and my blog for that matter know that uh, there's pretty much nothing that's too personal <laughs> I, I've gotten into trouble for uh, just the, the whole TMI thing so let's just wade into this um, the sudden removal of enforced behavioral discipline uh, yeah to some degree I mean just being constrained is like a pressure cooker you know like having your life completely regulated like anyone who's been to a lot of meditation retreats know that somebody who's put into this practical sensory deprivation maybe they're moving in slow motion you know eating in slow motion walking in slow motion getting minimal sleep and so forth they can some people just crack up so I mean it can just really I mean it's like a shit accelerator to some degree brings up neurotic stuff that kind of a thing so um living the life of a monk doesn't necessarily result in just blissful clarity and so living a more natural life actually can uh, cause fewer explosions or maybe not explosions but uh, less turmoil to some degree if you're if you're skillful at the way you go about things um but I mean, when you're living in the world, there are more distractions. You know, it's it is harder to be mindful when you know you've got a job to do and you've got people interacting with you, and most of those people are not really, um, you know, they're not dhamma practitioners. And uh, for one thing, uh, just driving a car, South Carolina especially is where I live. Um, they've got some of the worst drivers in America, apparently. Um, there's even some uh, empirical data to support that with regard to insurance statistics and so forth. And really, it's like half the people in town do not use turn signals, it seems like. <clears throat> and uh, some people just drive like idiots. And uh, I occasionally drive like an idiot. And so just having somebody almost smash into your car can uh, cause cuss words to flow from from the oral cavity this kind of a thing so yeah just living in the world and interacting with other people it, it is more difficulty or it is more difficult and um, yeah equanimity is uh, it's kind of strange it's like there's different levels of equanimity different kinds of equanimity like for example I've, I've told people I've, I told like a monk who was a Mahasi Arya once that uh, I've, I've just thrown conniptions mindfully where um, like for example one time I was in my cave in Burma and it was just so hot just you I could not be comfortable you know you'd, you'd wake up at four in the morning and sweating and you knew what it was gonna be like at two in the afternoon and uh, just the the chronic heat just started really getting to me and one time I was just uh, just cussing and slamming things and um, it was like something clicked and I was so used to being mindful that 
it was just like a part of me was cussing and slamming things, but there was this deeper part of me, you know, deeper down that was just watching the whole thing. It was sort of like being an actor playing the role of somebody throwing a conniption. And um, when you've had experiences like that, one really strong impression that you get is that deeper part's always there. So you can be just completely flipping out or whatever. Not that I uh, am in the habit of completely flipping out, but there's always this stillness. You know, there's just like this passive, disinterested, disinterested observer going that's always there. Um, another example of that was uh, my father was a, a hardcore alcoholic for many years. He was a, he was a rare kind of alcoholic in the West, but it's, it's fairly common in the in like Russia or Eastern Europe where he would just drink a, a fifth of vodka pretty much every day and you never really saw him drunk and you never really saw him sober he was just kind of fueled on alcohol and um, as was his his way one fine day he decided to just cold turkey and just stop drinking and um, he went to the DTs because he was really an alcoholic and he was just raging and just like tearing at his hair and peeing his pants and um, then he was he was hallucinating also and at one point he was he hallucinated this big eye on the wall just watching you know there's like this eye on the wall watching everything that's going on and he knew that that was like an aspect of himself you know there's like this deeper level that's just always watching and once you've, I mean, when you've had sufficient experience of that kind of level of consciousness, it, it abides, you know, it's, you, you have some connection with that. So that even if you're, you know, in a state of, you know, whatever it is, turmoil or despair or whatever at the surface, then, I mean, deeper down, there's always this calm, observing aspect that you never really are cut off from. So that kind of that kind of thing can still happen. Let's see. Checking the question out here. Let's see, have you found the grind of daily life to be eating away at some of your previously developed skillfulness? Well, I mean, just the the simplicity and clarity is it's not as much as before. Just because the my life is not as simple as it was before. And I have a, a lot more personal interaction, especially now that I have a mate, a biological mate. And, uh, yeah, I don't regret that at all. That's It's really nice. But still, I mean, it's just a whole different kind of, a whole different way of going about life than just uh, silence and austerity, living alone in a cave in the forest. But it's, it's uh, I mean, it's just a different, a different way of going about things. And ultimately, you can say it's neither better nor worse, although a, a devout Orthodox Buddhist would say, well, of course, being a monk is better. But um, it doesn't work for everybody. I think I'm just going to move on to the next question. Whether or not, regardless of whether I completely answer that one, because it's my show. Okay, Matthew asks the next question, which is, have you now answered, oh, you have now answered 100s of questions from a Western audience. What questions are people not asking that you think they should be? That's an interesting question. That's the first time anyone has answered, asked that one, I think. I have now answered hundreds of questions. Yeah, it's like uh, about 500 at least from a Western audience. What questions are people not asking that you think they should? Well, I mean, people should ask whatever they, you know, they really want to know. I don't want them to be asking certain questions that are interesting to me. Just if, if it's not interesting to them. I mean, if they don't really want to know. So I don't really have any, any complaints about what people have been asking. I mean, some people, uh, you know, they'll be asking like weird questions pee pee poo poo gay butt sex questions or, or whatever and i mean if they really want to know that i mean that's fine with me it's it's all it's all fair game so long as they're sincere questions um i suppose um fine points of dhamma 
you know, that's kind of interesting to me. Or questions about like what the original earliest Buddhism was like. That that would be interesting to me, and it, it would might be interesting to other people too. So, yeah, if you can't think of any question to ask, just ask something along those lines. And uh, it's interesting to me, so at least somebody's interested. But uh, all in all, yeah, I've got no complaints. People have been asking good questions, and that itself was a good question. So the last question from Matthew. What is your personal take on the Hindu concept of self, where all creation is essentially one thing? Brahman versus the Buddhist concept of no self versus the Christian idea that we humans are an imperfect reflection of the divine. What do you think is hitting closer to the mark? Well, I must say that, like with regard to metaphysics, I don't think that Theravada Buddhism uh, comes closest to hitting the mark because Theravada Buddhism, for whatever reason, it became materialistic. And so according to Theravada, Orthodox Theravada, physical matter is ultimately real. And just pluralism is valid. And um, yeah, I just I just don't see it. I'm, my thinking is more Mahayanas and always has been with regard to that. Um, I think the Theravadans would have done well to have uh, paid heed to Nagarjuna. Um, with regard to the Hindu concept, where all creation is essentially one thing, well, that goes back to the block of marble, doesn't it? I was just mentioning that. And uh, that block of marble could be called Nirguna Brahman, so long as uh, no statues have been singled out in potential or conditional form. But the thing is, like I also mentioned, like Hegel was saying, <clears throat> when you've got something that's infinite and formless, then uh, you can't really say whether it exists or not. And so it just goes off the scale. It's, you can't really talk about it. In, in any kind of valid way. So going with uh, Hin or Buddhist logic, you know, to say that it exists is invalid, to say that it doesn't exist is invalid, to say that it does and doesn't exist is invalid, to say that it neither does nor does not exist is invalid. So we have to kind of wallow in delusion or at least illusion when talking about this kind of stuff. And, um, you have to use dualistic language. I mean, language is by its very nature dualistic, at least to some degree. So, um, theists, including the uh, Vedantists, go with the error of is, it does exist, and then everything is a manifestation of that. Whereas the Buddhists go with the error of doesn't exist usually, at least the Theravadins do. You know, they, they speak in terms of, you know, voidness, emptiness, cessation, that kind of a thing. And, um, just, I mean, each, each side has its advantages, at least with regard to Buddhism. If you go with the doesn't exist, you know, like the, this, um, creation is essentially one thing where it's all sort of combined into this one essence, you know, the spirit of God or, or whatever you want to call it, the Tao. Um, you're reifying it and then you're like believing in that and it can be an obstacle whereas not believing anything is sort of the earliest most archaic philosophy of, of knowledge you know it's like it wasn't even really skepticism it was just you cannot know the truth by thinking about it and so you just clear your mind just make yourself wide awake without singling out any particular thoughts and that will bring you closer to reality um see but i mean i do have a, a lot of respect for like um shankara you know advaita vedanta that kind of a thing i mean you can you can uh, look at the situation from both points of view and kind of triangulate because both have their own um merits um, see, the Christian's idea that we are an imperfect reflection of the divine. Well, we're the, uh, the statues, the virtual statues in the block of marble. Um, 
But, uh, yeah, the Christian idea, like, we've got an immortal soul that uh, is different from all other immortal souls. And if you're going to go with any kind of self-view, then uh, I think the Vedantist idea that the, uh, the Atman or self is Brahman or God. So everybody is sharing the same soul, which is just that aspect of the individual that is ultimately real. You know, it's like the underlying ultimate reality that uh, you know underlies all of the illusion of Maya. That is, uh, you know, it's not entirely valid because nothing you can say about it is entirely valid. But uh, that comes much closer to the mark than saying um, there are an infinite number of immortal souls that are all different from each other, and that those immortal souls can change and so forth. But uh, in Buddhism, they just go with isn't and. Uh, no immortal soul and no real essence even other than just this conditionality of these you know conditioned conditions you know each condition that's conditioning conditioning us for example is itself conditioned by all these other things and it's just this infinite almost like an infinite regress of conditions conditioning each other and causing what seems like a physical universe or a, a phenomenal universe so yeah, we're, we're getting into some weird metaphysical waters in this one. So I think I'll just move on to the next question, which is by Toronto Nationalist. And Toronto Nationalist says, Are there any good resources like books or videos about celibacy or semen retention practices in the Dhamma? Hmm... Well, I mean, you can find a lot of stuff about celibacy just in the ancient texts. Semen retention practices, um, I mean, in traditional Theravada, semen retention practices simply means that uh, you don't have sex and you don't masturbate. But still, um, my experience when I was a younger monk especially is the semen is not exactly retained because periodically you just have like a, a pornographic dream in your sleep and uh the excess pressure is released in that way and that is um no there's no offense i mean it's it's um uh, it's completely allowable for for monks to have wet dreams and when i got into my 40s i stopped having them and i i kind of miss them actually um but with regard to uh, celibacy, semen retention practices, I did have a reader of my early blog who was really into this, and he actually had a website going just on the, the whole subject of celibacy and semen retention practices. And I'm sure that if you look on the internet, you can find all kinds of stuff about it. But um, to me, I mean, celibacy is, or something like that is the less you think about it, you know, the less you try to organize it and turn it into this system, the better it works. It's sort of like the fat lady on a diet, you know, it's the stereotypical fat lady on a diet who's just, she's tried all these diets and she's, she's like, like struggling to, to lose weight and just making a big deal of it. And it just kind of perpetuates it. You know, it's like struggling with it makes it stronger you know, it's getting muscles from all the struggling that she's doing with it. And um, that's one reason why um, oftentimes it doesn't work out very well for the nice fat lady. And it's the same way with, with just about anything, including celibacy and semen retention. I mean, the more you make an issue of it, the more, like, unstable it can be. Unless you're like a Catholic medieval catholic saint who just has this stainless steel faith that if you emit semen you're gonna burn in hell or something you have no doubts at all and it just drives you to the point of fanaticism where you're just gonna do it then yeah maybe that would work but um it's really hard for modern westerners to work up that level of just uh, single-minded wild-eyed fanaticism or uh, faith we really are not a strongly faith-oriented people here in the the, uh, the postmodern West. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, just do it and uh, don't think about it much. Is That's probably the best way of going about it. Um, 
semen retention practices. Yeah, also, I have I read in a book a long time ago how uh, the Chinese were really into that, the Taoists, where a Chinese man was supposed to preserve his yang essence, and he was supposed to get as much yin essence as possible, which meant he should have lots of sex, but he should not emit semen except with his, his wife for the purpose of making babies. And the rest of the time he should like retain it just so that his yang essence builds up and then he gets more yin essence from the female that balances the yin and yang. And uh, so that kind of avenue might be uh, worthy of, of research, I suppose, but it wouldn't really be Theravada and Buddha, Buddhism, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be Theravada Buddhist Dhamma, it'd be Taoism, Chinese Taoism. Um, <clears throat> but in Theravada, it just says don't do it, and just pretty much leaves it at that. So I'll just move on to the next question, after telling Toronto Nationalists one more time. I mean, just, I'm, there's lots of information on that subject on the internet, I am sure. But uh, I've never really been all that much interested in, you know, making an, like a, an issue of it. You know, all my years as a celibate monk, um, yeah, maybe, I'm, maybe I'd be better off if I, if I did, but um, it's just the rule says if you, I mean, if, if a monk has sex with uh, a male or a female or even an animal, then he's just excommunicated for life. So that would really, I was never even seriously tempted to get myself excommunicated. But um, <clears throat> just just with regard to uh, emitting semen intentionally, that's Sangati Sesa number one, which is, uh, it's a relatively serious offense. And uh, a monk who emits semen intentionally commit Sangali Sesa number one has to do penance for six days and six nights plus uh, as many days and nights as he uh, didn't confess it so like you don't confess it for a week then you got to do an extra week of penance and it's really a pain in the neck and you got to get go through this ceremony with 20 at least 20 monks of in good standing which can be inconvenient doing the penance itself can be inconvenient and just the thought of the inconvenience of it um, is a pretty good uh, deterrent from uh, rubbing one out, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just uh, move on to the next question. And this is from Rob, alias Dhamma Farmer. And uh, Rob's first question is, thoughts on Alan Watts? Question mark. And really, Alan Watts is apparently a controversial figure and um, he was mainly a writer about Zen, like back in the 50s and 60s, I think. And I've read one book by him, at least one, just called Zen Buddhism. And he's well-written, or well, I mean, he writes well. Well-written. Yeah, he, I mean, he wrote well. I mean, it was, it was easy to read and um, informative. Uh, he was sort of, uh, you know, there's a whole crop of um, Buddhist uh, promulgators back then, like Edward Conze was another one who uh, did more Theravadan stuff. And um, I don't know, I, I guess he was like messing around with girls and stuff and maybe he uh, you know, had like a shady side. Um, there's uh, Ken Wheeler, you know, the, the tattooed monkey live streams just says Alan Watts is just flat out evil. But then again, he says that uh, Trader Joe's is evil. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I really don't know that much about Alan Watts. I just read that one book by him, and it was, you know, standard, standard Western approach to Zen and kind of nice. And, you know, I've, I've heard a few of his uh, YouTube videos where he's just giving spiritual advice. I guess he was like some kind of advisor um, at, at like a, a college or something. So he did have some wisdom. He may have had a shady side though, like a lot of, of people who have wisdom had, you know, like, like the Bhagwan Rajneesh alias Osho. You know, he had some wisdom too. He definitely had his shady side as well. 
and there's there's lots of people like that so maybe Alan Watts was was among their number so I'll just move on to uh, the next question from Rob alias Dama Farmer I've heard a lot of debate on the eyes open eyes closed position in meditation does it matter thanks that's that's a good question and uh, I've I've heard some debate on that also and um, there, there, there is some argument in favor of eyes open because um, I have a, a restless mind by nature. It's um, udacha in Pali, just restlessness and agitation, which is common among Westerners. We're just like compulsive thinkers. Um, a, a, a Burmese village farmer who doesn't think very much, he can just sit down and just go into in relatively deep samadhi. But um, we Westerners, um, we just think a lot. And um, having your eyes open and just like gazing at a blank wall, for example, um, it uses up a certain amount of, of mental energy or like brain energy if you're, if you're into the materialistic explanation. And... Um, so it can like help to calm your mind just because some of the this excess energy of your mind is <clears throat> being expended on the the process of of seeing and some kind of meditation you just have to have your eyes open if you're doing walking meditation then your eyes are open or um doing casino meditation like meditating upon a colored disc or meditating upon a decomposing corpse which you're supposed to do in Theravada, but it doesn't happen very much anymore, um, then obviously you have to have your eyes open for that. In Zen, you just look at a blank wall, uh, is my understanding. But, I mean, if you are going to have your eyes open, you should be um, looking at something blank, something featureless. Because if you've got any kind of patterns or designs, then you're going to be distracted by those and you know, you're going to be like counting the squares or whatever. Seeing so, you know, on that that patch, it looks like looks kind of like a gargoyle, you know. And um, so, if you are going to have your eyes open and you're not doing walking meditation or focusing on like a casino disc or something, then you should have uh, your eyes open towards like a blank wall or something, or just having them open in the dark. I mean, it doesn't really matter all that much if if you're in, sitting in darkness whether your eyes are open or closed. But um, I used to have my eyes closed and then gradually, um, while living in the cave, I would uh, sit there with my eyes open. In fact, sometimes in a forest, I would uh, do a kind of improvised casino where I'd be sitting there looking out at the forest and they're just, my eyes would settle upon like a roughly circular patch of green that was maybe a different shade from the surrounding green and uh, just focus my, or not even so much focus as just like, you know, rest my gaze at that. And it's just sort of a calming, you know, semi-casino, I suppose. So, yeah, I, if it works for you, I mean, I mean, the real test is, does it work better for you? You know, you just try both ways and find out what causes your meditation to be better and then do that. That's probably the best advice I can give. So I'll just move on to the next question from Rob alias Dhamma Farmer. And that is as follows. Let's see. Buddhism aside and being as you have a theory regarding staring into the fire was our prehistoric ancestors meditation. Do you believe that if we go that far back, every human was enlightened? Being able to sample the world completely as it was in nature and not in civilization possibly created a people that could truly see the world from the experiences that we have heard historically from enlightened beings since. Would this theory have any weight behind it from your perspective? Well, from my perspective, I consider it very unlikely for a number of reasons. Um, I did write an article a long time ago, which is in one of my books, um, trying to come up with how meditation got invented in the first place. You know, sitting in formal meditation, I mean, somebody had to invent it, presumably. And uh, I thought one possibility 
was that it came from just staring into a campfire. Like in the Stone Age, people would just sit around the campfire. And uh, it maybe it's like an animal instinct in the human animal to just go into a mild trance state. I mean, I certainly do. I think pretty much anybody who sits around a campfire, um, you know, you just sit there and, and you're just gazing into the flickering fire and, uh, you know, you just go into a, a mild trance state and it might be, might have had survival value to keep people from wandering off into the darkness and getting snatched by a leopard or something. But it's, it's like a, a really mild trance state. It's not deep meditation. It's certainly not enough to get anyone enlightened. And in fact, I think that instinct to just gaze slack jawed into a campfire has a lot of people just addicted to television. It's, it's sort of the same instinct. It's a misguided instinct where we just stare slack jawed into a TV screen and, uh, you know, just the flickering light just has us in a mild trance. And I doubt that anybody aside from maybe uh, Chauncey Gardner in the movie Being There, ever became enlightened from uh, from watching TV. I don't know. So, also, there's the other aspect of people like Sigmund Freud, who believe that any civilized person is bound to be neurotic, but like somebody living naked in a jungle, like some savage living in a, in a state of primeval just primevalness in a jungle wouldn't be neurotic. And, you know, there was like you know, going back to Rousseau and the noble savage idea and all that, but they weren't aware of the way hunter gatherer people actually live. And, uh, they seem pretty messed up to me. And they've got so many superstitions and taboos that their mind is kind of locked into this really crude belief system in many cases. So, yeah, from that angle also, uh, I consider the people in a pre, well, pre-civilization, I mean, just going with the old scheme of things, you had like below civilization, full-blown civilization, you had barbarism, and below that you had savagery. And yeah, I don't think that Stone Age people who were barbarians at best really would be like noble savages um yeah just like like the myth of the american indians who just lived in perfect harmony with their environment and so forth um yeah i i don't think that there's a lot of validity to that argument so you had these stone age people who would go into a mild trance state looking into the campfire at night, but uh, it really didn't uh, enlighten them. And although they had fewer distractions with regard to um, just all the stuff that goes on in, in the modern world, nevertheless, they had all these taboos and, and just fear-based beliefs. They were like locked into survival mode a lot. And... Um, yeah, I don't think they were necessarily any more enlightened than we are. I don't really believe in a golden age either, for that matter. So I'll just move on to the next question. This is also from uh, Rob alias Dama Farmer. And this is kind of an interesting one. I've thought about this one a lot. If you cross or wrong an Arahant, does that generate more consequential bad karma than if you crossed or wronged a normie? And if the above is true, if you have not knowingly wronged the Arahant and karma is volition and mental states, then would the karma and consequences be lesser? And this is kind of, it's like a paradoxical position of Theravada Buddhism because there are stories in the texts of somebody... Like, there's this story of a guy who, uh, he's a rich man, and he offers food to a Pacheca Buddha. So this is before the time of the Buddha. You had this enlightened hermit. He's going for alms in India. And this rich man puts food into his bowl, or he has one of the servants put food into his bowl. And then after that, he regrets it. It's like, ah, I should have just given it to the servants. You know, this this these parasites on society, you know, these beggars walking around. And um, 
he got huge karma going both ways for that, according to this, uh, I don't know if it's in a sutta or a commentary, but it is uh, definitely Theravada Buddhism, where he went to heaven and hell both. I mean, he went to heaven for offering the food to the, to the Pacheka Buddha, but he also went to hell for regretting it afterwards. And he didn't even know that this Pacheka Buddha was enlightened. You know, so going with Orthodox Theravada, you really got to be careful about enlightened beings. Even, I mean, you don't even know if they're enlightened or not, but if you have like some bad thought about an enlightened being, you can go to hell for it. I mean, there's a, a story of, uh, oh, I guess, Soraya in the, in the commentaries. I think it's the Dhammapada commentary where there's this guy named Soraya and um, there's this <clears throat> enlightened monk taking a bath in the river and this this man Soraya he's a rich man he notices this monk and he's got this this perfect golden complexion and he's thinking I wish my wife had like beautiful golden skin like that and because of that thought he didn't know that this monk was enlightened probably even <clears throat> but because of that thought he immediately turned into a woman just instantaneously boom he, he's a female and um, that was considered to be a punishment in uh, ancient India. You know, it was like karmic retribution. And um, he had to apologize. Years later, he's already married to some other guy in, in, in some other town, Taxila, I think. And uh, he's, he's, or she at this point, has borne children to her husband. And then finally, she meets an old friend of hers from, you know, back when she was male and tells tells him the whole story and he says you gotta you gotta apologize to this uh enlightened being or apologize to this wise monk and after she apologized then she turned male again and then she was ordained as a monk and became enlightened but um so according to orthodox buddhism yeah you, i mean just the the slight just one negative thought about an enlightened being can really mess you up so I don't really get that, though. I mean, I'm kind of skeptical about such things. I mean, if you don't even know whether if they're enlightened or not, then, uh, yeah. Which which reminds me of uh, Ken Wheeler again. I suppose I shouldn't be talking about him, but he actually wrote an article accusing Mahakasapa of murdering the Buddha. And, uh, I mean, if these stories about dissing enlightened beings are true, and if Mahakasapa really was fully enlightened, he was the senior monk in the, uh, in the Sangha at the time of the Buddha's death. He was the, uh, the questioner at the, the first council and was considered to be enlightened. He was, you know, supposedly the most outstanding monk with regard to ascetic practices. And uh, if someone is accusing him of being a murderer, I mean, yeah. That's uh, from just from Orthodox Theravada Buddhism. That would be the road to hell. Just assuming that he really was fully enlightened and didn't really murder the Buddha. So, but again, it's it's like as Rob Alias Dharma Farmer here says. If karma is volition, you know, karma is a mental state, and you don't even know. Maybe deep down, there's like this connection like this empathic connection where deep, deep down you, you, you have to know that this person is uh, a superior being or something. But um, yeah, as there is a lot of emphasis on this idea in Theravada that when you're interacting with uh, another being, the more advanced they are, you know, the more benefit you get from doing good things with regard to them and the more danger the more you know, detriment you get from doing you know, bad things even thinking bad thoughts and i really don't see how that works it could just be um just early buddhists trying to like glorify their own position you know, it's like you better be careful about thinking bad things about us because you don't know maybe we're enlightened or something <sighs> So yeah, it is it is kind of a, a weird situation in Theravada Buddhism, but um, I would be more inclined to just stick with the idea that um, you, karma is really a mental state, and um, it might be that the arahant would just forgive you. You know, if if they're fully enlightened and you 
you know, kind of slight them. You know, you bump up against them on the sidewalk or something and don't say excuse me or anything. I doubt that they're going to, like, curse you or anything. So, yeah, it is It is sort of a, uh, like an enigma. Maybe I should ask Ajahn Punadamo about it. But uh, we did talk about it a little bit in uh, a recent video. But... Um, yeah, it is it is kind of a strange situation. I've I've wondered about that myself. And um I would guess that really, I mean, it just depends on your mental states and uh whether they're enlightened or not. Unless it does influence your mental states in some mysterious subconscious way, then it should be irrelevant. So I'll just move on to the next question, which is from Rafi 46. And Rafi 46 says a former Christian who is a Buddhist now posted on Reddit that he is upset that some Christians are proselytizing in Thailand. I think about responding the following. So he's thinking about saying the following bit here. Even if all Thais become Christians, you should not try to prevent this. Otherwise, you will violate the second noble truth of Buddhism. If you have a desire to keep Christianity out of Thailand, you will suffer because, according to the second noble truth of Buddhism, any form of desire is the cause of suffering. The Buddha, for example, was against the oppressive caste system back then, but he never urged his followers to actively try to stop it. Unquote. Does my response sound legit? Well, I would just say that, I mean, if you do something, you're not necessarily motivated by craving. Like, if you just see that one path is superior to another path, then by following the superior path is not necessarily making suffering for yourself because you're craving to follow the superior path. You always have to make choices, and you always have to, I mean, you always have to have some kind of behavior I mean, it's, it's really difficult to just sit motionless all the time. So, um, an example I give a lot is if you get a flat tire, then you get out and change the flat tire. It doesn't mean that you're against the flat tire. You know, there's no hatred or anger necessarily towards that flat tire. And uh, you just see that, I mean, this, the thing to do is to fix the flat tire. So you get out and fix it. It's just what you do. And it doesn't necessarily involve any you know, misery inducing craving. And I mean, you can go about just about anything in this way. I mean, like, um, uh, feminists protesting or something. Um, I mean, you can do it out of just like love for, for your, their fellow women, you know, I mean, it's, if they're motivated by positive mental states, then, you know, it's a positive thing. If the woman next to them might be motivated by hatred and resentment of men, and they're, so they're doing something negative, even though they might be just walking down the same street holding similar signs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's like, um, if you think that people being Buddhist in Thailand would make them happier, and just out of compassion for the people of Thailand you make, you know, non-violent, non-hostile actions to preserve Buddhism in Thailand. And that's not necessarily doing anything motivated by craving that is going to increase suffering necessarily. But it does depend on, on your volitions, your, your will, you know, your, your perceptions also. So, I mean, there are enlightened ways of going about it wiser ways and more foolish ways and uh if you've got wise motives and you're doing it wisely then you're doing something that's uh, probably pretty good on the other hand if you just like hate christians and you're doing it out of hatred for christians and not love of dharma then uh yeah you're gonna be making the situation worse so it, it reminds me of a, a book that uh I read a long time ago. It's one of the Seth books. I read I read a few of those. And uh, Seth, who is supposedly a multidimensional entity channeled through uh, a woman, Jane Roberts, um, he said that you won't get peace by hating war. You get peace by loving peace. And, you know, it's similar to 
to to this kind of situation, you know, if you love Dhamma and you try to promote that, then, you know, you're doing something fairly good. Whereas if you hate Christianity and, you know, you, you do the same kind of actions with that motive instead, then you're doing something negative and making bad karma, bad karma. So, yeah, just do what seems like the right thing to do and uh, have some equanimity about it. And there you go. So I'll just move on to the next question, which is from Yuichiro. And Yuichiro says, What do you think of karma yoga? Have you practiced something like it? Buddhism emphasizes meditation, but theoretically you can become enlightened through yoga of action. Well, that's kind of a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in yoga, I think there are four kinds. Of, let's see. You've got karma yoga. You've got bhakti yoga. You've got jnana, what, jnana yoga. You've got raja yoga. There might be another one, but those are the four that I remember. So karma yoga is the yoga of action, like serves. That's what Mahatma Gandhi was. He was a karma yogi. Or somebody like uh, like Mother Teresa in Calcutta could be called a karma yogi, even though she was uh, a Christian nun. Then you've got bhakti yoga, which is the, the yoga of devotion towards a guru or towards a god or something. And then you've got Jnana Yoga, which is, you know, like studying the Upanishads, reflecting on that and uh, just becoming enlightened through gnosis, through knowledge. And then you got Raja Yoga, which is essentially spiritual practice and meditation. And of course, Buddhism tends to emphasize the more head oriented ones like the, the Jnana Yoga and uh, the Raja Yoga, especially and really doesn't put much emphasis on karma yoga because karma just perpetuates karma. You know, you do you do actions, it just perpetuates more actions if they are volitional actions. So, yeah, Buddhism really doesn't put a lot of emphasis on karma yoga other than just morality. You know, like following the, the rules of monastic discipline, in a sense, could be called a kind of basic karma yoga, but that's not what gets you enlightened. To believe that actions will get you enlightened is... Uh, called sila bata paramasa which is uh, like clinging to morality and observances that enlightenment is uh, you're not gonna like cause enlightenment through your actions you can facilitate enlightenment just by you know doing good and avoiding doing bad and so forth but uh, so with regard to karma yoga as Yuichiro is asking about here it could be done through a kind of selfless action like what is promoted in the Bhagavad Gita. Like the Bhagavad Gita says, you know, whatever you do, don't do it for the sake of the end result. Just offer up that and the end result to God. Just put it all in God's hands. And um, that might be self-view from the Buddhist point of view, but at least it's a kind of selfless action. You know, it's not action motivated by you know selfish greed and so forth and that could be a kind of practice that would be conducive to enlightenment and i think that is how karma yoga is interpreted um at its highest level where it's like you know it's not you really doing it anymore you're just trying to empty yourself out and just becoming like a puppet of the will of of god or something so um yeah, if you do it selflessly, then uh, with with no greed for the outcome, no attachment to uh, the results of what you're doing or to uh, just the act itself, then it, it I mean, it, you can make progress doing that. So, yeah, so I think uh, it's, it's really not for me. I've never really been into uh, service of my fellow man other than through things that I enjoy, like answering questions, for example. But um, I'm really not, uh, I've really never been called to like bathe lepers or anything. So, but I guess, it, I mean, it, it is a spiritual practice. I mean, it's definitely got its uh, 
its benefits, whether you can actually become enlightened by washing the feet of lepers or not, I'm not sure. But it could be. I mean, you can get enlightened doing just about anything. So I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from Air Rain. And this is a history question. What effect did the cataclysm of 536 have on Buddhism and, and that region at the time? I recently heard that the period after was when Islam started spreading rapidly as Muhammad's family began feeding starving populations that were affected, etc. There must have been some serious upheavals going on in India and Central Asia during that period that also had lasting influence on Buddhism. Question mark. Well, first I should point out to those of you unfamiliar with um, the year 536 of the Common Era that, uh, yeah, it was considered to be the most miserable year in history. It was just a really bad year. And uh, the main bad thing about it was that there was some super volcano in Indonesia. Indonesia's got lots of icky volcanoes that explode every century or so. Not the same one, but, um, you know, they'll just just wipe out the entire island, all life on that island, and maybe a few surrounding ones, and will just darken the skies and cause no summer, uh, even in the northern hemisphere. And um, it's happened a few times in, within in historical times. Um, back in the early 1800s, I think, there was, uh, what was it, Mount Tambora, exploded near the island of Bali and it was like the year with no summer and 536 was worse it was a really big one and so it was uh it caused a lot of starvation failed crops just thousands of miles away the whole world was cooled way down due to all the dust and and de debris in the air smoke and so forth so there was that also 536 was the time of uh the first pandemic of plague, which in the in the West was called the Plague of Justinian, because Justinian the Great of the uh, Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire was uh, sitting on the throne in Constantinople. And uh, I think it was like about half the population of the Roman Empire died around that time, just through um, just all kinds of calamities. There was wars going on and starvation and, and the disease and everything. But with regard to India and Central Asia, which were Buddhist, predominantly Buddhist at the time, there was almost no history really. Uh, like organized systematic history of, you know, in this year this happened. It didn't really exist yet in India. And um, so, I mean, I've never really studied what was happening in India in the in the sixth century or Central Asia I mean is they were most I mean, yeah so I'm partly just ignorant on the subject of what was going on in India and Central Asia in the mid sixth century and probably they weren't keeping a lot of accurate records they did not have an objective sense of history like in the West like like the Greeks and the and the Hebrews they had this idea of or of uh, objective history and you know they would keep meticulous records and like Egypt you, you can say that something happened in Egypt in you know the year 2562 BC because you know they've got the whole lineage of the pharaohs you know the third year of this pharaoh and 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 on and on but in India and Central Asia they did, really didn't operate that way as far as I can tell and so I would say the, the main effects on Buddhism, it was spreading into China around that time, following the trade routes through Central Asia. So it may have been that like migrations of people trying to, to find greener pastures due to uh, especially the, just the, the changes in the weather due to the, the volcano that exploded and so forth. Um, you know, it may have facilitated the spread of Buddhism. But aside from that, I really... I'm really unsure what exactly was going on in 536 in, in India and Central Asia. Uh, probably they were affected, but uh, I really can't say. So I'll just move on to the next question here from IZ. And IZ says, 
David, what is your experience with and or opinion on the Sun Lun Seattle method? The one with people breathing funny for 45 minutes and then sitting still and we pasana-ing for a couple of hours. Is it similar to the Tanjidong method you are briefly in touch with or does it not involve hyperventilation? What is your opinion on the usefulness of intense breathing as a concentration method? Well, it's a, it's a good question. Good meditation question, although I'm really not... I've never practiced the Sun Lung method. It, it is sort of a... kind of a big deal in Burma. Um, it's not one of the most popular meditation methods, but there is a Sun Lun meditation center in Rangoon, and uh, Sun Lun centers, you know, scattered through Burma, and uh, Sun Lun Seattle is highly regarded. Um, and pretty much all I know about it is that you start off breathing fast. You're breathing harder and faster than usual, and... Um, he meant, uh, IZ mentions the Tanjidong method, and it was the same with the Tanjidong method, except uh, in the Tanjidong method, you did it all the time. I guess in the Solon method, you start off that way. And yet, the Tanjidong method, I mean, they were just essentially hyperventilating. And then they'd get drunk on oxygen and consider that to be PT, which is uh, one of the seven factors of enlightenment, sort of like a kind of exhilaration or. Uh, pleasurable interest is often how it is interpreted. And um, so you'd have people just howling and barking like dogs, laughing uncontrollably, sobbing, you know, flopping around on the floor like, like beached fishes and stuff. And um, it was sort of, yeah, it, I mean, it was not normal. And Sun Lun Masad is, is probably more reputable than that. You know, you, you don't continue breathing hard until you're just, you know, hyperventilating big time. Although IZ says it's for 45 minutes, which I didn't know. I thought it was just sort of at the beginning of the sit, you would breathe hard, a little harder. And the, the like the logic behind that, especially uh, Tenji Dong Seattle was, was talking about this, is, um, you know, when you're, you're breathing a little faster than usual, you have to keep your attention on the breath. So it helps to keep your mind from wandering away. Although, of course, there is the danger of uh, just hyperventilating. Although, I mean, you can't get into altered states through hyperventilating. There's like Stanislav Grof, um, who did a, spent a lot of time at the Esalen Institute in California. He used to use um, psychedelics like LSD to um, like induce altered states of consciousness in people. But then when LSD became illegal, he switched over to just breath work or... or what holotropic breath work, which is essentially hyperventilating. So, I mean, it, it can have some, uh, some positive effects, but if you read the, the Pali texts, like the, the Satipatthana Sutta, for example, it says you're, you're supposed to be calming the body as, as you're meditating, you know? So if, like traditionally in Theravada Buddhism, if you're if you're doing anapana, meditating on the breath, then your breath becomes more subtle. You start breathing, you know, sort of shallower and slower. And if you get into fourth jhana, or so they say, I mean, you can become like a hibernating squirrel where your your breath almost stops. So, um, in the text, it's you know calming the body, which is usually interpreted as calming the breath. You know, I breathe in, calming the breath, I breathe out, which is pretty much the opposite of what Sun Lun and Tanji Dong are encouraging. I told Tanji Dong about that once and uh, was kind of objecting to his method, which is unthinkable for anyone but uh, us Western barbarians. And he said that's only when you're you know, making really, you know, you, when you're getting to advanced meditation you know, you're really making progress, then it starts calming down, but that's really not what the text says. So, I did uh, I did meet somebody who spent some time at the Sun Lun Meditation Center in in Rangoon. He said, "Yeah, it works fine. It's it's a it's a valid method," but uh, he had some strange ideas. So, um, my best advice, I mean, if you've got the uh, the time and the you know the the wherewithal to to try it 
and you can see for yourself whether it works. I mean, that's really the the gold standard or the litmus test for meditation is you just try it and if it works, you know, with eyes open, eyes closed, breathing fast, breathing slow, whatever it is, you know, if you try it and it works, you know, your your mind is settling down and you're getting into greater clarity, then uh yeah, continue with it until it stops working. But yeah, I'm really no, no expert. This is it's kind of unfortunate in in this um this episode of question and answer I'm being asked about certain things that I really don't know a whole lot about. Sunlin method, Alan Watts, in the year five thirty six in Asia. So yeah, this it's just a, a hazard of, of this profession, I guess. So finally, the last question of of the show is from Chakra Gosha. Although there's sort of an addended an added question after this. Chakra Gosha says Is sex for procreation more virtuous than sex for pleasure? And then uh, Rafi forty six added after Chakra Gosha asked this question, he added, Didn't the Buddha condemn all forms of sexuality? Well, that's kind of a good question. Both of these are good questions. So it is true, getting sort of answering Rafi 46 first. Um, yeah, all forms of sexuality are uh, discouraged by the Buddha for people who are serious about practicing Dhamma. Um, especially at advanced levels. But... Um, just because, you know, it, it increases desire going with the four noble truths. Desire is the cause of all suffering and, uh, sex is a strong cause of, of desire. It really induces it sometimes. So there is that, but getting back to chakra Gosha here, um, is sex for procreation more virtuous than sex for pleasure? Um, probably, I mean, in most cases I would say, yeah. Because sex for pleasure is, you know, you're wallowing in sensuality, which is what a good Buddhist isn't supposed to do, or at least a good Buddhist is supposed to keep that to a minimum, wallowing in pleasure. And so if someone is just having sex for procreation, there's still, um, I mean, just having babies is is kind of a, a moral dilemma. Because some people will say in Buddhism, having babies is good because it's so rare to get a human birth that um that it's it's you're you're doing something good by bringing human babies into this world because a human birth is such a, a precious opportunity because it's almost only humans that really have the option of becoming enlightened you know it's like in the lower realms um the beings are are so tormented or confused that they really don't have the option of striving to practice Dhamma or they're just so ignorant, you know, like animals. Or in the higher realms, it's so nice, it's so pleasant that people really aren't spurred on to strive for something better. So the, the human level, according to Buddhism, is just the right balance of uh, wisdom and, and unhappiness that you're you're spurred on to practice dhamma but on the other hand um going with the second noble truth or the first noble truth which is to exist and to suffer i mean by having children you could be argued that you're really just damning some being to uh, one of the higher levels or medium levels of hell that you know you're just damn you're just dooming someone to a life of unhappiness because to exist is to suffer but just setting that aside, because that's really not the question here, is sex for procre procreation more virtuous than sex for pleasure? Individually, um, this, you're just living in the world, obviously. A monk wouldn't be having sex at all. Um, you're living in the world. <clears throat> Maybe it's just the reality that you should have children because in a, in a culture like ancient India, um, your children were your social security. There were no pension plans or anything. There were no... Um, what do they call them? I almost said the AK-47. What, what that, that pension thing that people do. I've even got one. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, for something. 
anyway, you know, you, your kids would support you when you get old. So, I mean, it was just what you do. Um, and, I mean, in most traditional societies, I mean, that's just what, it's like a person's duty to have children. So, I mean, if you're having sex for procreation as your duty to have children without wallowing in it all that much, you know, it's not orgiastic or whatever, then yeah, I mean, to the extent that you have less desire, you're, you're less wallowing in, in sensual pleasure in sensuality, then uh, yeah, it would be less immoral. I mean, it, saying more virtuous um, is uh, maybe not the, the most precise or exact way of saying it. it'd be like less unvirtuous. You know, the less you enjoy it, I suppose. Sort of like food, you know, putting salt and pepper on your your food to make it taste better is uh, it's kind of the same thing. It's it's in a way it's it's immoral essentially from the Buddhist point of view. Whereas you're better just eating something bland and plain just for the sake of uh, keeping your body healthy, so you can continue to practice dhamma. So, yeah, Rafi forty six is correct that the Buddha did. Uh, discourage all forms of sexuality because it is like the one of the major attachments that keeps us uh, keeps us stuck in samsara um, I, I read in a book once it was like desire for sex is the main reason for being reborn or reincarnation and the other ones are irrelevant they don't matter which was a kind of a joke so that's it that is all the questions. And if you have any questions, and I'm happy to try to answer them, as you may have noticed in this, I really can't make any guarantees that I will have any expertise in the field. But uh, with regard to you know basic Buddhism, basic Buddhist philosophy, metaphysics, um, certainly questions about uh, my previous lifestyle as an ascetic monk living in Burma, that kind of thing, um, yeah, I know quite a lot about that. Biology, I know quite a lot about that. So, you know, questions along those lines are more likely to be answered intelligently by me. And if you do have any questions, just feel free to uh, include them in the comments below or on the, the Discord server if you have access to that or on the my Subscribestar channel if you have access to that and uh, be sure to uh, like and subscribe smash that bell button as they say and uh, look through my URL links you might find something interesting and um, be happy